Welcome. Let's see. Just waiting for Todd. There he is. Hi, Todd. Welcome. Welcome to our Learning Revolution series for the Thrive community. And it is such a joy to be in conversation with you today. How are you doing? I'm doing great, Candace. I, I I felt like doing a little disco while I was. Uh, <laughs> That's what we like to do at disco. That's awesome. Uh, well, it is such a joy and an honor to be interviewing Todd. And for for those of you who have not met met Todd yet, um, Todd is somebody who is extremely passionate about building community and has been, it seems, for a very long time. So I'm so excited about this conversation. Uh, Todd runs a community advisory and consulting business called Clock Tower Advisors. I'm definitely going to ask about that name because I'm very curious and has been doing so, I think, like for nearly a decade, since 2015. And, uh, you know, Todd has exceptional expertise in the B2B space and in the nonprofit space. And we're going to talk about all things community why you build them, how you build them, everything Todd's learned. And uh, he's exactly the kind of person we love to interview on our Learning Revolution series because he has so much wisdom and experience to bring to all of you. <laughs> and he's really funny. I, I do have to say, you know you're going to have a good interview when everybody tells you, oh, you're so lucky you're going to be talking to Todd. He's awesome. So here we are. <laughs> Candice, you're wonderful for my ego. Thank you so much. <laughs> it doesn't need to be fed, but thank you. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm delighted. It's, it's wonderful to be in conversation. Well, I always like to start these conversations uh, by asking, like, what got you into building communities? How did this, you know, passion of yours come to life? I, I think everyone in the community space would tell you uh, that they ended up here completely by accident, uh, <laughs> but on purpose. Uh, you, you know, I think the direction of our lives, you know, leads us to this kind of work uh, that uh, requires a lot of different challenges, a lot of different competencies um, mm -hmm. to, to be good at it. Um, you need to like people and like to meet people and ask them questions and, you know, find out what makes them uh, excited about life and, and, and joining a particular group. Um, I... Uh, I, I would say, you know, to simplify my answer to that question, because I could go on for some time about it, uh, I originally got interested in communities online uh, mm -hmm. back in the late 1990s, early 2000s with online games uh, that I was playing somewhat obsessively and uh, thoroughly enjoyed, um, you know, running into um, some amazing tools like wikis. Wow. And um, and and live online chat rooms like like IRC uh, at the time, and kind of fell in love with that idea of sort of a community of people coming together around a purpose or an idea, and uh, and gaming communities, as you know, are quite passionate uh, sorts of places uh, where uh, people will argue, uh, they will role play, they will um, they will talk about policy, uh, and and. Uh, they're, they're big, wonderful, dysfunctional families uh, that, that are there. You, you feel very, very close to them uh, over time. And so I, I think I was kind of hooked on communities then. Um, as my career developed in parallel with that, I moved from being a recovering academic to, uh, to somebody uh, who was more involved with recruiting as a profession for many years. Um, I started embracing the social tools uh, that were emerging in the early 2000s. YouTube, LinkedIn, Facebook, sure. and a host of other platforms that no longer are valid or, or exist, um, and, and and started thinking very seriously about um, the value of community spaces. And so um, I, I formally, I think I, would, I took my first formal job in community building uh, back around 2013 uh, with a company called Seven Summits uh, based in sure. Milwaukee. And uh, led teams that did a lot of uh, uh, large enterprise social implementations of platforms like Jive and Salesforce uh, at the time. So that was that was kind of that that put me formally on the path. That was my career pivot away from recruit recruiting as a profession right. and into this space. I love that. You know, 
something I, I really believe is, you know, passion fueled career choices, right? And uh, much like you, you know, we started Disco. So for all those who don't know, I'm Candice, co-founder of Disco. I did not introduce myself. Um, and in a very similar way, uh, you know, I've always loved the idea of human connection. And like, there's nothing that lights me up more than conversations exactly like this one, where we get to, you know, I think you said it best is like learn with each other, right? Um, early, we're just, you know, talking about how much we, even when we're being interviewed, how much we learn, you know, and vice versa. And so this idea that like, humans are meant to learn together uh, really is what, you know, caused us to create Disco. And so it's such a pleasure meeting somebody who also has this passion of connecting with other human beings. Um, well, we're going to take this conversation in a lot of different directions, um, but I'd love to like poke at Clock Tower. Tell me about the name Clock Tower Advisors. It's such a, it's such a cool, cool name for a community advisory. Yeah, you know, uh, so a, a couple of different things were in my brain uh, when I when I, I came up with the, the name. Originally, I just wanted to call it Clock Tower, uh, but that's that's an expensive domain um, to buy. <laughs> and and I thought like I like the idea of a, a trusted advisor, advisory services, um, and 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 increasingly, I'm very interested in the world of fractional and fractional leadership and, and employment. Mm. Uh, we can maybe get into that if there's time. But sure. uh, the, um, the the clock tower piece of it uh, was informed by a couple of things. Really briefly, um, I was living in Milwaukee at the time, and anyone living in Milwaukee is aware of the Rockwell Automation Clock Tower, the four-sided illuminated doll, dial uh, cl uh, clock, and um, and it was sort of this thing like living over the landscape of of the downtown, and so it was uh, it, it was interesting, and in, in that it got me thinking about the history of clock towers and sort of their place in urban environments. Mm -hmm. And if you think back into, you know, medieval villages and those times like the clock tower or the, or the tower um, where time was told was a something that regulated daily life. It was a technology mm -hmm. that helped people know like when to go to market, when to go home, when the holidays were, but it was something that fell into the background. And so mm -hmm. as I think about the technologies we use to connect people online, my goal is always to, to look at the technology as something that needs to fade into the background. People don't need to be immediately um, aware of it. They shouldn't be aware of this utility that helps them to connect, but it needs to be thoughtfully put into place um, to do that. I think that's so wise and it's so aligned uh, with how we sort of see technology and platforms like it, it is it's interesting like my my background was in social media and in marketing and one of the reasons we built Disco was actually to not have the brand, right, be the platform. And in fact, that was what we felt, right, was that it's unfair. Like most people are building community on platforms they don't own, right, that actually don't allow them to do the things they want to do. And so, you know, I, I just love this idea of the clock tower being in the background, right, or, or being like, it's, it is important, it, it provides like the ritual, it provides the awareness, but it, it shouldn't be the main event. And, you know, that's what I believe for, even for Disco, we're a white label platform that is like intentionally designed to make your brand pop, right? And have that wow experience. And so I just think that's a really thoughtful, thoughtful way of looking at. It. I never thought of that. Like, by the way, that's so interesting because I, I'm not sure I would have, it's so wise because it's 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 exactly what you're saying is it should be in the you know background but it's really important the the uh, the less sophisticated version of that is that I'm a huge <laughs> comic book nerd and, um, and that sometimes the superheroes would hang out in the clock tower you know as like their their secret headquarters um as well uh, but uh... <laughs> even more fun I love that um, well that that's awesome so, you know, I think like one of the places we could start, Todd, is, you know, I know you just published uh, a really important article and it's most probably a really important question, which is like, should you even build a online community, right? And I think, um, you know, a lot of organizations and a lot of businesses and a lot of nonprofits are trying to figure out like, why community? Should I? How how do I think about what role it's going to play? How do you think about when a business uh, or a nonprofit should build a community? 
there's a there's a couple of really uh, important conversations you need to, to to have with your team if you're thinking about building uh, an online community as part of what your business is. I'm a big fan of community led businesses. I mm -hmm. think that they can be extremely powerful, but depending on the results that you're trying to drive, a community might not be the best first stop for you along the way. You know, with your with your digital strategy, if you are completely intent on uh, just uh, lead generation, for example, community might not be the way that you want to, you may want to lead off. Um, however, if you're interested in advocacy or mm -hmm. encouraging loyalty um, for the organization, if you want to ensure a better onboarding experience um, for, for newly acquired customers, those are use cases where community can do a lot of good. And so having a, a good understanding from your, your leadership team, from your ownership, and I don't care whether you're a startup or a sure. established enterprise, it's the same set of questions. What effects are you trying to drive? And, and if the, the, the top three things that come out of your mouth aren't related to, um, you know, helping, uh, you know, uh, either, either being sort of like the voice of industry leadership, you know, for whatever your vertical happens to be, or retention or acts of advocacy, testimonials, referrals, um, those sorts of things. Idea innovation uh, is another great use case for community. Um, ticket deflection, you know, is, is a, a common use case for B2B style communities. So, uh, so not all use cases are created equal in terms of the value that community can drive. And so having some, some thoughtful conversations about that um, are important because Community can be notoriously hard to measure a return on investment if you're not clear about what you're trying to do. And, and it is a more of a long tail benefit you know, to organizations. It is tremendously powerful, but it can seem a little abstract to some, to some C-suites and helping them to understand that is the work that I love doing. Uh, but uh, but you know, organizations that Think it's a matter of turning on a community platform and be, and you're off to the races. You're setting yourself up for failure. In those cases. Not quite the way it works. Exactly. No, I I, I think that's really really helpful um, context. And let's double click on some of those. Right. I think um, you know what I heard you say that really resonates is you can't just build it and they will come, right? Like, I, I think there's an element of this, as you just said, oh, we're just gonna like throw a community together and, you know, there you have it. Uh, but it sounds like when you're working with organizations, the ones who are most clear on what their objectives are, and I think you said three really interesting things. So onboarding, which I'd love to like double click on because we have a lot of amazing onboarding programs. Um, that, that sort of use disco and I'd love to get like your um, why onboarding what what is it about onboarding that makes community uh, work really well in its favor let's start there and then we'll go through some of the other ones sure sure so I mean community can drive a lot of value around onboarding experiences and it's something that organizations have a good chance of benchmarking effectively by comparing it to people who did not join your community and go right. through your onboarding. Right. So uh, being ready to take a look at that in terms of when somebody signs up for your product or service and they're then as part of that introduction to your platform are invited into the mm -hmm. community. I've seen a few organizations I get this right recently. I think uh, I think Miro does it really well. Yeah, for example, there are, there are some others, but uh, you know, baking it into your initial uh, email welcome emails. Uh, mm -hmm. That oh, by the way, you know, we've got an amazing community where you can get peer help, and where you can find frequently asked questions, where you can file a ticket easily if there's an issue where you need some help, where you can learn best practices around how to use this product or or service. Um, you know, those are those are some wonderful ways that community can can help uh, those those customers to to get yeah. get out of the starting gate. Like I think a, a challenge for a lot of organizations with uh, with product adoption can be overcome with community, where uh, they you know sometimes it's a matter of getting them to create their first 
you know, taste of using whatever the product or service happens to be. Um, just do that first thing. And community can help by offering models of, you know, what other people have done successfully by having people in those communities who are, you know, sort of your super users or your top fans of what your, what your service is, who can talk about their own experiences, like what worked well, what didn't, um, or who, who can even maybe answer some basic questions or having champions from your organization in the community to offer some hand-holding and white glove service approach to, to some of those things. Um, you can include tutorials, video-based, you know, screen, screen grabs, you know, record looms about how to use uh, the product or service. Um, and, uh, and as I said, like FAQs and, you know, document libraries, all those sorts of things are, are and, and, and even learning experiences are really helpful things that can make that community make a real difference. Yeah. I love that. And I love that you brought up the Miro team because I actually just interviewed the Miro team or they actually interviewed me, uh, which is pretty great. Um, about a week ago where we were really talking about exactly that, like why Miro you know, they credit a tremendous amount of the success of Miro as a product to their community onboarding and their community of practice. And, you know, it was it was a really authentic experience where people were sharing their best practices and their uses of a product. And I think I think you hit hit the nail on the head is like there's so many powerful products, but it's really overwhelming, right? To understand what even is possible in a product, right, on your own sometimes. So, you know, hearing from experts like yourself, for example, you know, or, you know, the Miro team, like actually getting that shared experience and lived experience is a nice word, I think, to use in an onboarding use case, um, both of what to do and what not to do and templates uh, so I, I completely agree, like doing that right can have a massive, massive impact uh, for onboarding. And, and the more abstract your product or service is, the better off you're going to be having a good community uh, experience of, of providing those guide rails or, you know, a very clear flashing button, start here, right? <laughs> uh, you know, this is, this is where I go um, to begin understanding how to use this product or service. Yeah, I think something else that is really interesting and in, in sort of you articulating onboarding is at the end of the day, all products are here to solve problems and the technology is actually usually only a part of solving the problem. But by bringing the community together, there's like a shared wisdom or a collective wisdom around solving the problems that you're using the product to solve. And so if you can... You know, I'm curious your thoughts on that. Like if that's a reason why, you know, you feel onboarding is an interesting use case. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think you're you're absolutely right. I mean, bringing people together to to solve uh, those those kinds of problems, uh, you know, together is, uh, you know, they're, you know, it's not a misery loves company thing. It's a, uh, it's a uh, people coming together to solve a problem, you know, makes the problem easier to solve. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll sometimes talk about this as the woolly mammoth effect um, of, of communities, where if you think of early Neolithic societies, um, where you know family units banded together, they had to do so because there was a woolly mammoth in their neighborhood trampling over their, you know, their their world. And you know, uh, what do we do about this existential threat in our neighborhood? Well. Maybe we should hunt and kill it. And wow, you know what? If we do that, then we've got food and, and clothing and things for the for the next season. And the next thing you know, it's the community built around the woolly mammoth, you know, as a, as a concept. And so, uh, so that that sort of collective problem solving, uh, you know, leads to a sense of solidarity, shared lived experience, if you will, and uh, that sense of belonging that's so essential that I think is built into all of our DNA, except for the most sociopathic among us. <laughs> For sure. And I, I think, you know, one of the things we say at Disco is like our mission is to empower communities to experience like lifelong learning and human connection in a world that needs it more than ever. And I think the world that needs it more than ever is the interesting part because people are very isolated today in many ways. And, you know, there's just like an abundance of content, but like we're kind of missing the 
the connection piece. And I think that's the difference in, I don't know if that's your view around this, but that's you know where our ethos comes from. I think we are in increasingly lonely, uh, which was a, a post that I had put up uh, about the the event here today. You know that uh, there there is a documented epidemic of loneliness. Uh, right. I think it's global. Uh, I know it was documented in the United States for sure by the Surgeon General uh, some some years ago. But uh, you know the, the fact that people point to fewer deep friendships than they yeah. than they ever had, um, feeling disconnected and sort of the the effects of isolation um, mm -hmm. and sort of that feeling of, uh, you know, not being connected to other people, uh, you know, is debilitating to the effect that it has physical, detrimental physical effects on us. Uh, that it's, that I think the Surgeon General said it's the equivalent of smoking two packs of cigarettes a day uh, right. you know, for, for years. So we, we need, we crave those connections. And um, while I think you'll you'll certainly find a segment of people who say, "Well, I don't join these online things, you know, because I, you know, I'd much rather meet people face to face." Great. Not everybody has that option, and why not think of it as both? Like, yeah, yeah. I'd love to meet people in person, yeah. and I I love to stay connected with them online. You know, geographically, I don't always have the luxury of living next door to somebody in my community. I I think you're hitting on such an important point, right? Which is like. The future of work and learning was forever changed post COVID. And, you know, I, I think while you're absolutely right, like my preference, if I could choose, I would be in person with you right now. Like that's the honest truth is like, I love people and I love human connection. But what I know is like very close and the second best option is being on Zoom with you right now. And guess what? It's like 10 times more accessible, 10 times more affordable. 10 times more sustainable. And so for organizations and just for humans, it may not be like the best, but like as all innovation happens, it's like 80% is good, right? And so it's absolutely an end. And I, I always encourage organizations to have like a 10 poll in person, but that's not sufficient, right? That's like a one and done. So then how do you sort of keep that community going or elongate it or, or create that like recurring through digital. And I'm curious, like, is that something you're in having a, a lot of conversations with organizations about like hybrid in real life, you know, the place of online and virtual, like how does that come into the, the, the conversations at the C-suite? It's really interesting. I think there, there, there have all, there's always been interest in that. Uh, it, the extent to which it's actually practiced is another question. I think if you look at things like the events industry space, there's a lot of talk about community building uh, in that space, but they, they're, it's like they're circling around the issue and haven't figured out a way in, you know, in the way that the community space, uh, the work that you and I do around you know, using these platforms to keep people connected 24 seven, 365, yeah. Um, events events management hasn't quite wrapped no. that yet. They they haven't they haven't figured that out. Um, I think a lot of enterprise organizations love the idea of like their annual conference or kind of big events that they go to and having people meet there, uh, but they haven't necessarily bridged that gap over to the ubiquitous, ongoing you know party that never ends. You know that in in our our individual community spaces. So there's. There's work to be done there. Right. Um, that that being said, I'm always looking for those opportunities. So there's a customer that I work with right now that in, is involved with. Uh, they're they're a nonprofit. They're very interested in enabling medical students mm -hmm. to come together and share more nuanced ways to care for their own mental health and to be, be better listeners to their patients. And they are they are bringing together student groups from across the world um, for those conversations. Uh, and, and they, they have a, you know, an annual student conference and an annual member conference for faculty and students that I think has been, that those have been key milestone moments for growing the online community following. Um, Absolutely. So I think like building those, those things go together like chocolate and peanut butter, right? You know, yeah, I, I love that you're saying that because I, I agree. I think it's like, 
it's not or, it's it can be and, and it's a huge amplifier, right, of, of the each other. So I think that's really, really interesting. And 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 what I if I could just say another word about this, like the the where I go, so I'm 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 actively involved with some uh in-person organizations in my community. I live in a little town in northeastern Wisconsin on the shore of Lake Michigan, and I'm part of my local business association, and I'm part of my local rotary club. And I, I love the in-person component of that, the, the service-oriented, you know, community, you know, element of that. Um, but what I find is that um, those, those individuals who are uncomfortable with digital kinds of, you know, community connection products, you got to be very careful about how you socialize a technology solution for those individuals, because, you know, demographically, psychographically speaking, you can't always just kind of say, oh, I'm going to turn on a Facebook group and that's going to be fine. Or I'm going to start a, a WhatsApp and these, these youngins are going to really love, you know, using, using that as a platform. You can't make those assumptions. You have to validate with the groups that you're working with and what's going to work best for them. Uh, I, th I think that's a really interesting point. And so moving on to that, I think understanding how you think about technology platforms when it comes to community design, like what's important to you? How do you evaluate, you know, different platforms and what are you really looking for in a technology platform when it comes to building different use cases? It's a big question, right? Uh, <laughs> you know, there, there are, you know, there, there are levels of trust um, that I look at that have an, that, that, that the technology has an impact on. So at, at its, at its base level, um, you need, you need to assume that the the platform seems to have a uh, you know some kind of security. Uh, if if the if the sign in is wonky, um, that's going to send people away in droves. They're just you know, for sure. And end users have no tolerance for poor sign on experiences anymore. Mm -hmm. And so, if there are issues with you know validation or the password resets that occur randomly for no good reason, and there are some enterprise level platforms that that have yeah. these problems. Uh, then, then that that's going to be a major problem, you know, for for selection process. So so you know, feeling a level of comfort around that, feeling that it is a contemporary user experience design. In other Absolutely. words, as somebody that is using social media platforms on a day to day basis, it should feel like I'm using something that's up to date and that has you know common user experience, you know, uh, you know, good practices uh, around it. Those those things need to be in place. Um, when we start getting into discussions of features, uh, you know that, that, that I'm, I'm also looking at things like: um, is my data ex exportable or import importable? You know, in, into the platform. Mm -hmm. um, you know, is there some kind of analytics platform there that is robust enough that I can export data and maybe enrich it in another tool if I need to, or combine it with other data if I need to? Um, you know, the uh, is is the platform. Uh, does does it have some capabilities that are going to fit with my use case? Like if, if I if I want to do certifications, it needs to have some kind of LMS yes. um, capabilities. Uh, lear learning needs to you know be building courses in that space needs to make sense. Some of my customers need uh, the ability to have a, a document library or or a document repository of some sort. Um, you know, it's not uh, unusual to ask for some table stake things around. Um, you know, being able to control my notifications and have, uh, you know, direct messaging and the ability to post or even to create blogs and things like that, you know, within the spaces. What I would say is there are, there are a lot of things that I see as table stakes um, yeah. within, within the community platform space. Um, increasingly, um, there's been, I, I, I would say, like, since the pandemic, a, a resurgence of all sorts of new ways of trying to think about or, or, or create community platforms so that they're more turnkey in nature mm -hmm. uh, so that I don't have to do a lot of configuration, that there's lower cost of entry. There's maybe a little more limitation in terms of how much I can trick out that experience, but I can, I can really get that platform configured pretty, pretty quickly and easily to do what I need it to do. Um, that becomes increasingly an issue with larger enterprises where, um, you know, the, the, the large enterprise community platforms that are out there 
I, I partner with many of them, um, but they've got a high price point yeah. and, and they, they have capabilities for integration, but that, that can often take months uh, to, you know, to get those things into place, um, to get them working. Whereas there is a generation of apps, uh, community-based apps out there that are mobile friendly. Maybe there's yeah. a, you can have a, a dedicated mobile, um, mobile mm -hmm. app associated with them. They are um, easy to set up and configure and move so that in, in my book, like as a, as a community strategist, I don't have to worry so much about the technology setup of it. I can think really about like what's important. What is my strategy for mm -hmm. engaging members in this space? What are they going to be doing when they're there? How can they make the most of that experience? And then how can I realize value from it as well as the as the owner of that community in terms of like, you know, how do I know that people are using it? You know, are, where, where are they finding the most value in it? Um, you know, what, what are the, what are the use cases that are, that are coming out of it from, you know, from, from, from my standpoint in terms of, you know, the things we discussed at the very beginning of our conversation. No, I love that. I mean, I, I think you highlighted some really important points here, which is one, um, you know, there's just table stakes at this point in the evolution of community platforms, right? That make it like, you know, a, a go, no go. And what I'm hearing you say is like, actually the, the design, right? Like the feel of the platform, there's been so much evolution and change, right? That like, you don't want to feel like you're in a platform from like 2005, right? <laughs> Um, and I think like the the table stakes for members or for learners is that they want to feel like they're in a really beautiful, premium, seamless, intuitive environment, right? That just feels natural because we all are so used to community platforms, right? Like we've been trained, like this generation has been trained on a UI that is fundamentally different than, you know, the generation before. And I think you pointed to sort of mobile, and you also pointed to like the frictionless experience, right? Like the minute I lose my password and you don't know, like you don't give me a magic link or an easy way to get in or an untrusted thing, like I'm out, like I'm just not doing it. Um, and I think the other thing that we're just huge believers in in Disco is that community and learning go hand in hand. And most platforms have designed either learning as an afterthought to community or community as an afterthought to learning, right? So like the relationship between these two very important things like matters a lot. And I, I wonder if we could like double click on that, you know, in particular, mm -hmm. um, it's definitely a, a passion of mine, but how do you think about like the, the relationship between community and learning? I, I think they've, they've been kind of friends for years, but, uh, but, but that whole, I, I love the idea of like what you're communicating about disco where, where it comes together um, as an, as an integrated experience, because it's often not integrated enough. Like uh, I, I've certainly helped communities where they had the community platform over here, click this link, and then you go over to think <laughs> New login, new like you know yeah, friction yeah. like process, and it's not a lovely experience, you know, to to have to do that. And and even now, like I'm in an evaluation process with a with a customer where we're looking at um, two standalone apps because we we don't necessarily know that there's a great community based app with a great LMS, you know, built into it. We're looking at some of those. Full disclosure, looking at you guys too, you know, as as, as, as a potential for that. Yeah. Um, but that, but but the 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 potentials for integrating that LMS experience with um, with with the online community are things like having cohort groups uh, with exactly. groups of learners together um, in a private space within the community where they can learn together and grow and kind of feel those those ties that happen when you have a smaller group that comes together that the, the greater intimacy, greater sense of vul shared vulnerability within the space, people learn, when people have an experience, they learn something together, they bond. And, and those, those are friendships that can last for years and years um, to come. Um, also being able to acknowledge accomplishment um, within a community space. When you're in that wider community yeah. and, and you've earned, uh, you've, you've completed a certification or you've taken some tests or you've gone through a course and you get you know, a badge around that, um, that means something to the other, at least it means something to the other people in the community. Yeah. It means, that, it means that you've 
engaged in effort uh, to, to learn those things. So I, I'm a, I'm a big fan of seeing those, those experiences integrated. I love it. I, I, you know, you, you, you hit on something that is just such a fundamental belief of ours is that communities are not audiences and communities actually don't scale like linearly like they you need smaller groups of connection in order to have that depth of experience mm -hmm. to therefore you know get get that sense of value and i think like it's interesting we we built disco actually at a time where cohort based learning right was fairly of the moment and new and so subgroups and subspaces and like the ability to have smaller groups within the group experience a personalized and relevant experience is just like a fundamental belief of mine because I I love people and I don't I I love like large groups but it's usually small groups that interact that make you realize that there's more people like the depth of these people in the larger community but a lot of the tools are broadcast. They're not really designed for peer-to-peer -peer or project. Absolutely. And, and you, you think about those, those smaller groups, like it may seem counter counterintuitive to, to some organizations to think like, well, I, I'm building this online community because I want everybody together <laughs> talking to each other. That's what it's supposed to be about. But you know, when have you ever walked into a big networking situation? Like you, you, you know, there's yeah. a, you know, uh a networking event in your in your city and you go to a local bar and you know there's there's like hundreds of people there uh you know unless there's somebody you know that you're there to meet with and hang out with like you're probably going to hang out with them to start with just a, a little group but like a big group like that that's intimidating as heck and it's even worse in an online setting where text continues to be the central experience of of online communities there, there are a few notable exceptions of video based or AR, you know, XR, AR, you know, kind of, kind of based yeah. communities. But for now, this is, this is what we've got. And, you know, keeping people, uh, you know, getting people into smaller groups where there is a little sense of uh, a connection is important. I, I was having a, a, a wonderful conversation a few weeks ago with a gentleman who, who did a lot of work in co working spaces. And we, we got talking about sort of physical architecture versus virtual architectures. And, um, I'm, I'm a fan of the book, uh, uh, the book series around not so big houses. Um, and we, we talk about like in, in, in architecture, the gathering places for people tend to be kitchens because that's <laughs> where everybody congregates and they want to, they want to talk a little bit or on um, that book also talks about the importance of alcoves. So little places where you can kind of pull off to the side and have side conversations and things like that. Our subgroups are those alcoves. Those I I love that so much. Like, I just want to hug you on the other side. Like, it's like, yes. <laughs> I got you. <laughs> because, because um, you know, like the human experience, like the shared experience happens between people. And I think we forget that, right? And, you know, you want also what, what I feel like you're saying and what, what, you know, is so important in community design is that, if you have a deep experience with a small group of people first, right, it kind of goes to your onboarding, mm -hmm. uh, then you have the clue that there may be other deep experiences to have with other people. But if you have a very cursory experience with just like, you know, broadcast, and it, it sort of is that it's broadcast versus peer to peer, then you actually don't know that that's even possible, right, in the in the community experience. So yeah, like I, I feel like we should have flags saying subgroups, you know, <laughs> subgroups rule because that's really how we've designed, you know, disco is is for that subgroup kind of experience. Um, I, I know we are, I, we have about 10 more minutes and I feel like we're just getting started. So this has to be part one of like, hopefully many more. We need to have a lot more conversation. Yeah, because this, this could go on for like another two hours easily, right? <laughs> well, um, but I have two questions that I want to ask you that I want to uh, get to. So one is, I hear you have this amazing community consultants collective, and I want to give you a chance to talk a little bit more about that because it's, once again, it's like a gathering of passionate people who are trying to learn and share wisdom uh, that's, you know, very meta because that's kind of what you all do. So tell us a bit more about that and... Um, what 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 that's all about and 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 sort of why you built that 
Yeah. So, uh, so the Community Consultants Collective, there's the little logo for it. I'll do a Fancy. little product placement. Um, so the, the CCC uh, was started up uh, a couple of years ago, um, post-pandemic, uh, by a friend of mine and colleague, uh, Deb Shell. And she originally had pulled it together as sort of a support group uh, for entrepreneurial community consultants, uh, people that were on that independent freelance solopreneur path of helping other organizations set up and run online communities. Yeah. Uh, I, it really resonated with me. I, I have been you know, obviously in the space for, uh, for, for well over 10 years and love it. And I, I, this is where I live. This is the work that I do. Uh, now and uh, I, as I was working with her and thinking about it, we we started, you know, collaborating on on bringing the group together, and uh, I really wanted. I, I started thinking about it in terms of there's a uh, I don't know if you follow any of David Brooks' writing. He talks he, his latest books of really New York Times columnist uh, and political pundit, but he he's been writing a lot of books on character and character formation lately, and um, he talks about. Uh, sort of the first and second mountains of your career. And first mountain is establishing yourself professionally, having, you know, earning a good living, having a good life, all those things. I'm blessed to have, you know, those those wonderful things. And second mountain is really about trying to help others and trying to establish a legacy, you know, uh, that does some good in the space. And so I am really pinning my hopes to the, the Community Consultants Collective as a group that, you know, for the long term is going to help others who decide that they want that independent path. Like we've seen a lot of full-time community consultants get jettisoned um, unfairly out of their organizations that they were in. And, you know, some of them have decided that they want to just go the consulting route, but they have no idea how to yeah. start or run a business. They don't know how to write a proposal or a statement of work um, and, you know, or to deliver to business or how to fire a bad client or any of those kinds of situations. And so um, we've, we've grown to about 150 members um, over the past year globally. We represent the largest group of community consultants in the world um, that, that's out there. And I'm very proud of, of the group. And we come together on a monthly basis and basically share wins, share concerns, uh, talk about some leading practices, um, from that lens of being an independent, whether you're a contractor, whether you're a consultant, an advisor, or a fractional uh, leader, um, it's this, it it's a home, and and it's not a high intensity community space, but it's there as a resource and as a support network for anybody that that well, shouldn't I, have to be lonely to come back absolutely. to it. <laughs> I mean, I I just think you're you're it's so wonderful, like hearing that you've pull that together. And, and in so many ways, it is like the ethos of why we believe so passionately about the power of community, because I do believe that like the best way to learn is with other people and from other people and by sharing, you know, lived experience with other people. And we think it is like a fundamental shift in how young people and old people are going to build skills in the future, right? So it's like, it's it's so it, it's so core to like our belief of the future, right? Is that shared communities, sharing lived experience, learning together with each other um, is, is such an important part of the fabric of how the, the, the world is gonna learn in the future and how we have to learn about new things because the institutional systems that exist, like you can't go really to community institutional school. And even if you could, is it really worth it? It's different. It's a different kind of engagement. So I just love that you're doing it. And I love what you're talking about, about like second mountains, because I think like beautiful things happen when it comes from a place of generosity and when it comes from a place of, you know, pursuing a purpose in a different way than pursuing accomplishment. So well, thank I, you. Can say, I think it's really beautiful what you're, what you're we, doing. We, we definitely have an abundance mindset about what we think the potential is for community building uh, for organizations across the world. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say like, uh, it's not, it's, it's definitely not all me. Um, I, I would, I would put myself in the back of the group of people that have led this. We have, we have a dedicated board uh, that uh, when we incorporated last year, we have an elected board 
that mm -hmm. um, that comes together on a biweekly basis and and is trying to build this organization in a very transparent way mm -hmm. um, to help those who, who join us because the, the trust is absolutely essential um, in an organization like this where we're all entrepreneurs and we all have a vested interest and um, but but we believe that as community professionals, if anybody can do it, we can. That this is this is yeah. something that can be done in, in an open-hearted and transparent fashion. I love that. Um, I want to leave. Uh, I think we have to wrap up in a few minutes. I could have gone in so many directions, and I feel like this is part one, hopefully, Todd, of like multiple conversations. Um, but some some last words, some wise words on people building communities uh, for organizations right now. Any Anything you wanna kind of leave people with as a an inspiration or just a, a guiding message on sort of how to, how to be thinking about this in 2024? Well, I mean, I think there are a lot of things we, we could say, but I think that um, what I'll what I'll leave everybody with is to think about the the problems that you're solving. You know, for the people that are joining your organization, what is it that that they need? And what I would what I would challenge anyone that's that's listening to this to do is to is to not only think about what you think the members of of your community need, but then also you have to do the work of actively talking to them about it. Um, if, you, if you're not validating that information um, that, that you think they want, you're going to probably miss the mark to some degree. And, uh, and I've run into this in large and small organizations where they'll bring me in as a, as a strategist and I'll say, okay, I'll work with the leadership team. We'll figure out, you know, what it is that they want and we'll get a, you know, a, a good audience profile, you know, the, the members that you want to be, you know, parts of that community. And then uh, and then we've got to validate that. And they say, well, we've already, we already have pretty good understanding of our personas. Really? Do you? <laughs> and it's not a matter of applying your marketing personas. Uh, your, your member, your community member personas are going to be different than your, than your outbound marketing you know, pers personas that are there. And uh, you need to talk to those individuals. And I, and I like to talk to anywhere between 15 and 25 uh, to get a pretty good picture uh, of that group. Can you do smaller groups? Yes, fewer is better than none, uh, but sure. uh, you know, so many organizations just want to skip over that. And so I would, I, I'd like to leave everybody with that message of, you know, that validation is essential work to be done. I love that. I mean, I think it just plays to, you can just tell you're, you're so genuine in your practice and in sort of your guidance. And I think that is at the core of what communities are. They're about people connecting with each other. And so being of service to what people actually want from a community and listening deeply, like having that empathy and, and sort of listening before creating, I think is uh, such a great piece of advice for all, for all of us. Right. And we're, we're all like fall into that trap, right. Which is like so much to do, so little time wanting to skip over, but it's really in that like creating the space and the presence and the, the listening that you can build the empathy and then build from a place of, you know, what people are really needing and wanting. So Todd, uh, absolute pleasure speaking with you today. I think you do phenomenal work. Uh, I love the clock tower and I've got like, now I'm thinking of all the superheroes in the clock tower since my 11 year old is, <laughs> obsessed with superheroes uh but thanks for being a superhero in the community space and uh excited to continue to build our our partnership and and journeys together as we help create amazing lifelong learning and human connection opportunities in community such a joy to be with you today candace and candace and getting to know you a little bit more i look forward to further conversations likewise have a great week everyone